Welcome to the podcast where we take a deep dive into the stories behind construction business leaders. We will share how they got started, how they found success, and the lessons learned along the way. I'm your host, Eric Fortenberry. Welcome to Builder Stories. Welcome back, everybody. Today, I'm here with Rick Williams from Williams Professional Painting. Did I get that right, Rick? Yep, you did. And uh, you're located in uh, Alexandria, Virginia. Is that is that the spot? Yep, right outside D.C. We serve the whole D.C. metro area. Awesome. Well, uh, ha- happy to happy to have you on Builder Stories today. Why don't you give us your background and tell us how you how you got into painting? Sure, we'll do. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, we started actually way back 1979. So I'm a second generation business owner. My dad started the company. So I think I'm a fairly typical story. You know, as a kid and teenager hanging around job sites learning how to vacuum, how to prep, how to clean, do all that stuff first. So uh, growing up, my dad had a mainly residential painting company. So I worked with him all through high school, summers, weekends, all that. Uh, Did that, then went out on my own for a little bit. Everybody has to kind of go their own way for a little bit. I was a police officer for about seven years here in the area. Uh, Got married, wanted to start having kids, realized that wasn't probably the best uh, job to have for family life. Enjoyed it while I was young. Uh, Also enjoyed getting out of it. Family business always kind of has a way of getting you back in. So I yep. came back in 2005, so coming up on almost 20 years back. Um, when I came back, it was time to sort of start growing the commercial. So that's kind of what what came next. And uh, we're, we're basically a uh, residential commercial painting company in the D.C. metro area, um, doing all kinds of institutional churches and schools and condo work and uh, build a pretty good team here for uh, painting. Awesome. So what, uh, I mean, what, what motivated you to, to, to become a business owner and to start your own, uh, you know, start your own business? Yeah. So I'd say when I came back, um, my dad had already done a great job laying the foundation, you know, had a good residential base underneath us, had maybe 10 or 12 painters at the time. So we're doing pretty well in the residential, but I knew if it was going to grow and support two families and get to the next level, my motivation was to just kind of start growing things from there. So very yeah. fortunate to join some networking groups and some peer groups with some of the guys above me that I was able to you know, legally steal a bunch of ideas from because we could all share. Um, went and visited some companies bigger than mine, learned a bunch of stuff there, and really just set off to kind of start doing the commercial. And once I built the base, uh, we were pretty fortunate. Things grew pretty quick. Um, we have a team of 50 to 60 plus guys now and uh, run around doing a lot of commercial work. So I guess motivation was just kind of, you know, needing to be a large enough business to support two families, I would say. Yeah, the main so motivation. 50- 50 uh, to 60 employees, is that what you said? Yeah, we have a mix of employees and subs. We probably have about okay. 40 employees. Um, and then with the type of commercial work that we do, sometimes we need to scale up pretty fast. So sure. we have vetted subcontractors, some that we've worked with for years. Um, so that way that allows us to kind of keep the field workforce in that 40 to 60 plus range, depending on how many, sometimes even more than that, depending on how many projects we have going at a time. So, so tell us, like, what did that, you know, kind of how did that ramp up period look like? I mean, when, when you first started it, you know, kind of what was that mix of employees, the subs and, and how, you know, how have you, how have you figured out when to keep hiring and, 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 and when to, you know, kind of add to the team? Cause I know a lot of people struggle with that and trying to understand like, when is the right time? Do I, do I hire another employee and do I yeah. keep adding to the team versus, you know, do we hold the line? Like, how do you go about thinking about that? And what, what's that journey look like for you? Yeah, well, one of my old consultants I remember that was a big influence on me, a guy named Russ, told me it was always, you don't grow to make money, you make money to grow. You know, try to sort of almost burst at the seams on purpose until you are so clear that you have to add people uh, and then add people and go from there. So the residential base is generally more employee-based. Um, it's, yeah. it's not ideal to use subcontractors on the residential jobs. Um the commercial jobs tend to need more bodies. Uh, it just is more of a natural fit for larger crews anyway, which is where the subs come in. Um, I would say one of the hardest things was building the office team and building the admin and, you know, kind of piece by piece, you know, okay, we're finally to where we need a full-time scheduler. Okay, now we definitely need a full-time financial admin and kind of just one at a time adding people until you, you know, uh, and you do have some swings and misses and try people out and realize they're not right for the team. Yeah. Um, so our growth has been fairly steady and gradual, you know, 10, 15% a year, not one of these like double in a year type of situations. Sure. So that's also been a lot easier to manage over the years. And tell us a little bit more about that kind of that office team that you've built out. What's, what's that look yeah. like? So we've got a, 
or receptionist, basically. We always like to just have one person that is the first voice the customers talk to. Sure. And honestly, what's funny is that is one of the hardest positions in the company to fill is a receptionist that is super friendly and super organized. We've had people that were super friendly and not organized and super organized and not friendly and <laughs> um, very uh, recently have found somebody we're really happy with, uh, a newer girl named Kat, but it's it's really important to have customer service. We have a dedicated receptionist to schedule estimates, uh, schedule it or schedule the jobs and the crews, who goes where. Obviously, it's pretty chaotic. Um, we call that position chaos coordinator because um, <laughs> running that many guys around the field with weather, interior, exterior, residential, commercial, out of town work, it's pretty complicated. Yep. Um, we have a team of about three to four salespeople, you know, that are key project manager salespeople. Most of them came through the company. Um, you know, one of them was a, a foreman, then a carpenter, then an estimator. Another one was just a painter, foreman, estimator. One sure. of our office, uh, our original office manager decided she wanted to do more sales. So she grew into a, a full-time sales and operations manager. Uh, we have a facility manager to manage all the equipment and the paint and the power washers and sprayers getting in and out. Um, production manager to kind of roam around is a new position that we're working on to kind of keep the guys, you know, on track on hours and that kind of stuff. And then, you know, obviously owners behind the scenes. And then we tend to outsource most of our our marketing and our, you know, financial QuickBooks health, offsite bookkeeper and that kind of stuff. So in-house we have eight to 10 employees um, that kind of are dedicated to the admin side. That's awesome. And do you guys have like, uh, is there like a, a, a workshop, a shed kind of where, you know, you oh, yeah, we have a full building. warehouse. Um, warehouse, we're, we're, okay. We're, yeah, we're pretty fortunate in that we uh, we found a, a really nice building here that close to the Bellway, we can be downtown in just a few minutes, uh, but we hit the suburbs pretty hard. Nice. And it's a, we have about a, a 8,000 square foot warehouse. It's about half warehouse for all the junk and then half offices for the office people to work. Nice. That's uh, that's exactly how with my construction company, kind of the, the back half was was the warehouse, all the storage, yep. equipment, things like that. And then on the front half, we had all the offices. Yep. Wall right yeah. down the middle. <laughs> so so how many jobs are you, are you running at one time? Uh, average daily schedule could be 12, could be 15, could be 18, depends on the size of the job. Um, okay. Smaller residential jobs are usually done with two or three people. You know, they could be anything from, we do small jobs, painter for a day, uh, up to one week, two week, three week residential jobs. Commercial jobs can run the gamut from, you know, going to a condo complex and painting one day's worth of doors all the way to either going out of town or doing a huge building here where, you know, we can have jobs that take six or 12 months sometime sure. before we're done. So do you have different, you know, you, you said you you typically use more like subcontractors for the commercial side, but you're, you're in-house for the residential side. Are you, do you have different people who are selling to the residential versus the commercial? Um, no, I would say we have a couple of people that slant more focused on one or the other, but okay. pretty fortunate since we've, um, all of our estimators have been here 14 plus years. Oh, wow. So they can do both. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, naturally a couple of them probably do a little more one or the other. Um, but we're pretty fortunate. The estimators can all do both. And I would say about half our foreman can float and do both, but it is a different mindset doing a residential job versus a production commercial job where you have deadlines and much more work to get done in a shorter time. So I'd say maybe a quarter of our foreman are commercial only, a quarter of our foreman are residential only, and the other half float between the two. So for, you know, for other businesses out there who, you know, I know a lot of times people kind of wonder what it's like on the other side, you know, how, how would you, you know, how would you compare and contrast, you know, doing, doing residential work versus commercial work, you know, from, from a profit margin standpoint, from, you know, kind of dealing with, you know, kind of the, the punch list and yeah. getting things over the goal line to getting paid, like, you know, kind of what are some of those biggest, uh, you know, biggest differences that you've seen and, you know, do you, do you have a preference towards one or the other? Yeah, I mean, they both have their place. Um, so, you know, from coming when I came back to being 5% commercial to now we're probably more like 60% commercial. Um, I want to keep a balance and do both. Um, the residential jobs are obviously great for cash flow. You know, usually they're short-term jobs that you get paid right away on. Commercial can take more time. So I'd say that's the benefit of having the residential jobs. Now, residential interior jobs are very delicate. You know, you're in someone's home. Uh, the homeowners coming home every night and looking at it, they're going to see that one tiny little spot. It's going to drive them crazy if you don't fix it. Yeah. So we do have some foremen that are really geared toward being their own picky customer. Uh, some of my foremen are probably more picky than the homeowner is going to be. So I really don't have to worry about it. 
Um, the commercial is different. You know, if you're doing a shopping center or a hospital or something huge, it's generally not going to be, not that we're going to come in and do poor, quick, sloppy work, but you know, when you got a whole wing of a hospital that you need to get done in two weeks, there's, there is a different level of expectation. Yeah. And a lot of times that's written into the contract. You know, there's level five finish on drywall where it needs to be perfect. And then there's, you know, level three, if it just needs to look presentable to the public type of thing. So commercial, the larger jobs, you know, more risk, more reward. You can have highly profitable, larger commercial jobs that you would never, you know, be able to get a, a million dollar residential project is probably not going to happen on a paint job. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot larger projects, but in my opinion, it's not really great to do all one or all the other. Yeah. Is, uh, do, do you have more trouble getting paid from one or the other? Yeah. I mean, residential usually pays pretty quick. That's usually not an issue. You know, commercial, we tend to be, we're in the repaint world. So we deal mostly direct to owner. We do some work for other contractors. We do a little bit of work that's even for the government, places like that, retail, yeah. corporate. Um, it just all depends on how big the corporation is. Sometimes there's even layers between us. You know, we're the subcontractor for another company that's working for another company. So those things can take longer to get paid, but uh, yep. you just have to have a plan for it. And how do you go about, like, kind of, do you, do you have payment schedules where, you know, you're trying to collect some up front along the way, or is it, you know, you, you having to wait to the final completion? Like, how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, typically our residential jobs, we're trying to get, you know, standard 30% schedule res reservation fee, you know, to get them on the books and plan and do what we have to do. And then usually those are just going to be a deposit at the beginning and a check at the end, unless they're, you know, a very large residential project. Commercial sure. is kind of the same. You know, you need a deposit. Sometimes you're on a monthly draw schedule. Sometimes you're bi-weekly. Uh, commercial work in my eyes is really all about like finding the companies that do business the same way you do business and learning if you can fit into their pay structure. There are companies where you, I've had to walk away from jobs because it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, but most of the time, if you find a company like yours, you know, everybody wants to get paid. Everybody knows we have to get paid. It's not a secret. So you just got to talk about it up front and be ready. Sure. And do you think that, um, you know, like, a, a, do you feel like there's more kind of price, um, you know, resistance on one side or the other? Uh, you know, we, we did a lot of commercial work as well. And, you know, uh, there, there were always kind of the, the NTEs, the not to exceed, or they looked at, you know, kind of that maximum unit price that they're willing to pay. Um, do you get a lot of uh, kind of pushback on, on, on the commercial side or on the residential side? Not necessarily. I would say almost you probably get more pushback on the residential side with the homeowners not realizing yeah. what materials have skyrocketed to. You go into Sherwin-Williams and you're looking at retail paint and, you know, 60, 70, 80 bucks an hour for the good stuff. And people don't really realize that. Sure. Um, so it's probably more typical for the homeowners to be like, uh, oh, wow, it's going to be that much. Um, commercial people generally know, and the kind of commercial work that we're chasing and we're doing is usually higher dollar. A lot of times the competition is eliminated because there's not a ton of other painters um, that want to do the type of work. We do a lot of lift work, swing stage work, scaffold work, high profile work, difficult hours. So the more, sometimes the more difficult job is, the better it is because there's only going to be a few people that really want to get into that. Yeah. Um, so... Price is not always the issue. And generally, of course, making sure that you have the reputation to back it up, that you have the quality, that you have the foreman, that you have the word of mouth and everything to to validate the cost. Um, we're really proud of the team we built with our foreman. We did a survey. We're kind of updating the website right now and everything. So we just went back and looked at all the hire dates. And uh, average is 13.6 years. Wow. So, and that counts the new guys. So, I mean, we've grown a bunch of guys. we got a lot of 15 plus year guys here. And once we know they can make a customer happy and do it to our standard, you know, we're going to do whatever we got to do to keep them. So, so why don't you tell us, I mean, a little bit about kind of the culture, you know, how, how are you, you know, how, how are you motivating these guys to, to want to stay with you for so long? Cause I know turnover is, 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 is definitely a, yeah. a challenge for a lot of construction companies. So what, what's, what's the secret to, uh, to what you're doing to keep, keep people happy? Yeah. I mean, we still do have turnover you're, you're, with this many people you're always going to. We, we just lost a good carpenter this week that we found out he had, you know, he had to move to California for family reasons. It happens. Yeah. You know, leave on good terms. A lot of our guys come from our guys. So I would think a key culture thing is, um, you know, we do a hiring bonus. If our foreman brings somebody here and they're good, they work out, they're here for six months, you know, both parties get a, a sign on bonus. Nice. Um, I mean, it sounds trite, but, you know, take care of your people, they'll take care of you. You know, yep. we don't quibble with them. We give them PTO and they need some paid time off to take care of something with the family when they're sick. We just pay them. Um, so mainly it's just kind of that 
you know, culture of, of becoming friends and people feel taken care of and they're not necessarily going to look somewhere else. Sure. Um, we've done things like, it's been a while, we're probably going to restart it up soon, but uh, we paid an English tutor to come into the office two nights a week and teach sure. the guys English. We have a, a, a basically all Hispanic workforce. Yeah. Great guys, hardworking guys, but, you know, some of them are more self-conscious of their English than we are. We communicate with them fine, but they want to do better. So we've done English classes for them. We take care of them. I think little things like that go a long way to making them say safety is important. So, you know, we make sure that they feel taken care of, that we give them all the ladder training, safety, fall protection, lift. We do all that training in Spanish too. Uh, Information is too important for them to not get in their native tongue. So I would think safety, you know, pay them every week, never miss a check, pay them early, don't quibble with them. Like I said, pay them an extra dollar to an hour more. Uh, than the other guy might, and you don't have to have them wander around all the time. Yeah. How often are you guys getting together for, you know, for team meetings? Like, do you do kind of the, the, the trainings all together? Is it like a, a, you know, monthly thing, a weekly thing? Like how often is, is the whole team together? Yeah. That's another thing that was hard dealing with this whole COVID period that we all had to go through is, <laughs> you know, it made it hard to do that. Um, yeah. and we did honestly lose a little bit of culture doing that. I think most companies that have a lot of employees looking back would realize that they did. So we've been working really hard on, on doing those. Uh, back to the monthly production meetings. We also do a lot of face-to-face job visits. I mean, I want the estimators and the salespeople, myself included, you know, go out to the job site, meet the guys, buy them lunch, take them lunch. I love uh, it. Ask them how they're doing, ask them what's going on. Um, so it's a lot of individual one-on-one job connection. Um, and then we've done whole company picnics where, you know, everybody brings their family or rent out the water park, you know, and get a couple food trucks you know, and have a nice day for them that way. I think those are good team building things. Um, and then the production meetings, you know, I like kind of like two phase. You got to sit, you got to talk about money, you got to talk about hours, but then also sort of that time in the parking lot with everybody bonding uh, is sometimes just as valuable when you're trying to build that culture. Yeah, man, I, I love that. I think people often underestimate how important it is to make sure that, you know, you, you're you winning over the entire family. You know, that person's spouse is, uh, you know, in, in what they think about your company yep. and and kind of the, the work that, that, that their partner is doing, like that's, that is very, you know, important and that can weigh, you know, very heavily on somebody if, if they don't have, you know, the support at home for the company that they're working for. So I'm, I'm also a big believer and it's, it's so important to try to find ways to involve the extended family, you know, in that culture building. It sounds like you guys definitely. have done a great job. Yeah, definitely. We're going to uh, look forward to planning another one of those this year. Yeah, that's great. So like when, when somebody, let's say, you know, cause, cause I, I, I love the strategy of giving you know, your, your employees an incentive to recruit, you know, additional team members to your team. But, you know, when someone does bring, you know, someone to the table, like, how do you, how do you evaluate them? And how do you know, like, is this, you know, it, it, are, are we hiring this person just because it's a friend, even though they may not, you know, have that same, you know, skill set or experience or, or be able to deliver the quality that we're expecting? Like, how do you, how do you fully vet, you know, all of these people that, that, that you're bringing onto your team? So that's interesting. Um, Obviously, a couple of years ago, there was a pretty heavy labor, labor shortage. Um, we're still kind of in it, but we're still kind of not, depending on who you talk to. So we had to go to the guys and have a pretty frank discussion about how come some of you are bringing people in here, but some of you haven't nominated anybody. Don't you want yeah. the, the bonus? And what they would say was, yeah, but if I bring them and they're not good, you're going to be mad at me. And we kind of had to be like, no, no, no. We just need to try them out. We need bodies. Bring them. We'll try them out. If they okay. don't work out and meet our culture... I would say the fact that our guys have been around so long on average means that it's a little bit hard of a club to break into. So if they come, we're probably going to know within the first week or two whether they're going to work out long term or they're not. So you got to have a system to babysit them in the beginning, put them with a senior foreman uh, for somebody to watch them and make sure, you know, quality control the work and all. But typically we find that people either come and we've had people come here and say, whoa, you guys work too hard. This is hard work. (laughs) We don't want this. And then they move on and we're like, cool, we just saved time. Yeah. Um, or they come and, and we have a couple really demanding older high-end foreman who can do anything. And we kind of talk about it in here. Like that's how we know when we've got a new good guy is if it's like, wow, you know, this foreman yep. and that foreman and this foreman, all three of them said he was good. We'll give him a raise and lock him up because we know he's good. So a lot of it is self-policing. Um, you know, the guys are the ones that have to go out there and perform the work and do the work. So yep. they're pretty good at, at, being straight with us about who's worth keeping on the team and who's not. Yeah. It's, it's funny how when, when, when they're sitting there doing work right alongside somebody else, regardless if it's their friend or, 
or, or whoever, like they, they want to make sure that person's pulling their weight, Yep. you know, or, or, or they're going to end up doing, you know, even more work. Exactly. So what, do you mind sharing? Like what, what is that bonus? Like, you know, uh, what yeah, is it, I what think is we're it? up, I think, uh, I think we were at 500, okay. uh, 500 at six months and another 500 at a year. Okay. So in other words, that the, for, the, both. For both? Yep. So the new guy will get 500 and the guy that brought will get 500 at the six month mark and then they'll get another one at the one year mark. So basically it's going to cost about, you know, $2,000 to get yep. a new employee on. But, you know, at our rates and what we're producing at, obviously it's well worth it to do that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent. I'd rather, you know, somebody who's willing to stick their neck out on the line and say, I recommend this person join us. Yep. You know, I'd rather take somebody who's, who's, you know, at least to some extent a known trusted, you know, person that, They've got that much more of a reason to care and to want to do a great job versus that random person off the street who's responding to an ad that you really don't know anything about them. Exactly. And we have had instances where we've had to cut people. Um, you know, you never want to wait and do it at the five and a half month mark because then it just looks, you know, punitive. Yeah. So you got to be careful with that. But we've brought some people on and just had to say, hey, this isn't a good fit. They got to go. And, you know, hey, Jose or whoever, thanks for bringing them here. And this is nothing against you, but he's just not cutting it. Yeah. And the guys have always been very understanding and very good with that. Um, it's yeah. also led to some cool scenarios where, we're, you know, obviously we have a lot of older guys, but we have a mix of younger guys too. And we're trying to grow up that next generation of workers to do it in the trades. So we actually have two sons and a couple nephews. And, you know, we've got like four or five <laughs> guys hanging around under 30 that, you know, are here because their uncle worked here or their dad worked here. They've seen that it's a good place to work. Sure. So that also helps out. Do you, do you find yourself, uh, you know, kind of leaning towards wanting to bring on more experienced people or, you know, less experienced, but more moldable, trainable, you know, kind of where, or, or is it just a mix of everything? It's a mix of both. I mean, in a perfect world, you'd, you'd love them to come in with both, um, yeah. but that just doesn't always work out. So that's how we, we have a couple of foremen who are nephews and younger, you know, relatives of guys that have been here and they've been hanging around the shops since they were 16. So, you know, we were seeing them at events, talking to them, knowing them. Um, and that's kind of the best of both because they've learned yeah. how to do it our way. Um, and sometimes we find guys that have all the experience in the world. We were just talking about this earlier. Um, sometimes you'll find a guy, great craftsman, um, but he's just difficult to deal with and the guys don't want to work with them and they will run him off no matter how good the work is. Because yeah. um, yeah. some people, it's just not worth the, you can't measure the lost production of a bad attitude spilling yeah. out to the rest of the crew. What what size crews do you do you like to run? You know, is it you know, a hundred percent dependent on the job, or do you try to keep you know certain certain guys together? You know, you got your your one person, your two, your three person crews. Like, what is what are your yeah, crew sizes? That's look like? the hardest thing. That's one of the hardest things to figure out. But typically sure. on residential, we found two two man crews are just typically the most productive, unless it's a massive job. So we'll even do whole houses, large houses where we would just have a set a two or three man crew. Okay. And, and I don't care if it takes them a month to do the job and get it done and get it right. If you put four or five guys, it's really not going to get done that much faster. And sure. we can work in a neat, systematic, organized pattern in the house so the customer knows what to prepare for. The commercial side is very much more just job specific. You know, we have one person commercial jobs and we have eight to 10 people commercial jobs, depending on deadlines. You know, for instance, some examples like right now we're doing a parking garage. So they got to shuffle all the cars in and out. So it's a pretty tight schedule. So, you know, there's going to be six or eight guys on site working quick. We're doing a hospital. That's the same thing that has a, a team of six to eight guys on. But I would say average two to three residential and average three to four commercial is pretty typical. Sure. So on those on those commercial jobs, which, you know, typically going to be your, your much larger jobs, you know, you, you said earlier you're, you're leveraging subcontractors okay, for those. Okay. Are you are you basically having your subs bid on the job and give you a price that you're going to turn around and, and, and sell? A mix of both, um, depending on how large the job is. A lot of these guys, you know, we've built a relationship with them over the years too, and I have some subs I've been using for five, six, seven years. Now, I don't use them exclusively in the winter. You know, typically, obviously, we're slower in the painting world in the winter when we can't paint outside sure. um, up here in the Northeast. So there are times of the year where they have to go work for other people. Obviously, they got to do what they got to do. But when we're busy, you know, we try to pay them enough so that we're on the top of their list and they'll take our phone call first and come back and do our job. Yeah. Um, so I would say that's kind of the answer to that is they're pretty sort of vetted, experienced with us. They know our system. 
small, medium jobs, they trust us. You know, we price the job. They already kind of know what we're charging because um, they've done enough jobs for us. So it's more along the lines on that of, hey, I got a new job for you. It starts next week. Here's your paperwork. Here's your payout. Um, no, you have to treat them fair and not burn them out because if you burn them out and don't, you know, squeeze them now, too hard, they're not going to want to come back for you. So, um, well, well, tell us, so, I mean, how are you structuring that that compensation, that payout? Is it, you know, is it based on, you know, square feet? Is it based on how, however many days it takes? Like, you know, a little, little bit more insight into how yeah. you, you go about thinking about, you know, the, the cost and then, you know, uh, also how, you know, how you're, how you're pricing it. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it all comes down to how, how long is it going to take? There are jobs where we price by the square foot, but really that just sort of turns around to at the end of the day, okay, well, if it's this many square feet, how many square feet should we be able to paint in an hour? So yeah. two guys in a week. So they've obviously got to pay their guys by the hour. Um, we've got to cover the materials. So it would be more along the lines of, okay, this is three guys for two weeks. Therefore, you know, we've obviously f- tried to figure out in our PL what we need our labor percentages to be at. And I know it's totally different between deck builders and landscapers and roofers. And that's what's been cool about job trade, trying to sort of meet some other contractors that do other trades. But, you know, obviously, you know, the goal to everybody who loved to be around 50% gross profit and, you know, try to keep your field yeah. labor around 30, 40%. Um, so that's kind of the numbers and the targets that we're shooting for. And I mean, are you, are you taking into account like production rates and, you know, kind of to, to come up with how many days or how many weeks you think a project's going to take you? Yeah. Luckily, we've got a lot of sort of systematic uh, experience with, like I said, these estimators have all been doing this for so long. Yeah. They can typically walk up to almost any job and go, okay, we've got to paint this garage. You know, we've, and, and sometimes you're almost back, backing into the math. Like yeah. The customer is telling you, we have two levels of this garage and they each have to take three weeks. So then it's just how many people, based on my experience, do we need to get it done? Yeah. That kind of tells you the price and just, then you're just working to make sure you meet it. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, what, what would you say, what, what's been, you know, some of your biggest challenges in building this business and, you know, what, what do you, what do you wish you would have known, you know, a few years ago that, that you now know that, you know, what improvements would you have made? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think we've kind of already talked about it in a, in, in a, you know, roundabout way. It's the employees. Um, we're, we're lucky that we're based out of DC, which is a pretty busy area. So typically marketing and finding leads isn't our problem. Um, usually more it's getting enough guys to meet the backlog that we create. <laughs> um, so I would say it's definitely, it's the culture, it's the guys. Um, I would say when I was younger, of course, you know, you sort of probably passed on some projects cause you weren't comfortable or weren't confident enough in your numbers or your prices. And, you know, there is a time to say no and walk away from jobs, but also, you know, after you get enough experience, sometimes you just realize to go ahead and take that extra chance and do it yeah. and, you know pull out all the stops and do whatever you got to do to make it happen. So COVID was interesting for us because we started adding and learned some, some new tricks we didn't have in the bag. Uh, that's kind of when we started our traveling painting section, you know, before we had just the residential business, then we kind of grew the commercial business on top of it. And then just pre COVID, we had started sort of dangling with traveling a little bit and <laughs> COVID made it really easy to do that. Cause all of a sudden everybody's out of the way, there's no traffic. Um, so over the last couple of years, we've been focused a lot more on that as well. So we kind of grew a traveling division. We probably worked, we worked in about 17 States last year, um, oh, wow. going around for customers. Some of that is branding and wayfinding and signage work where we're working for other sign companies. Okay. Uh, some of it's hospitals, some of it's banks, some of it's self storage places, uh, light industrial work. You know, once just kind of like we talked about earlier, if we find a, uh, a sub that does a good job we're going to do anything we can to keep them. And if we do a good job, then we kind of get dragged around by these other companies sure. uh, getting more and more jobs for them. So I would say, you know, early on, I probably wish I would have been a little more aggressive, a little quicker looking back, but you know, you don't know what you don't know at that point. So for the, for the travel jobs, I mean, are, are you, are you basically giving everybody, you know, a per diem for their food, for, you know, their travel cost? I mean, are, I assume you're providing the vehicle probably for for them to travel and putting them up in a hotel room. Yeah, that's when it's been great to be in some of these like peer groups and kind of what you're building here too is cool, you know, where you can talk to other contractors uh, about other stuff besides job trades sometimes too and learn. But I'm in a couple other networking trade groups. So I'll drop a name real quick, but CPIA, Commercial Painting Industry Association. Sure. Um, if there's any other painters listening to this, and I know that is one of, one of my goals is to get a few more painters on this site so that we can share more 
direct painting info back and forth. But um, I learned a lot from other companies and my networking groups about how to handle the travel components of it. But yeah, we do per diem. We generally cover all the lodging. You know, we figure out a verbo or a, a better way to do it than hotels. Sometimes just flat out rent a house, rent a verbo. Or yeah. job trailers, cargo trailers that we can tow out there and leave on site. Typically, they're either longer term jobs where you're out there for several months or they're like a chain of something like, you know, self-storage place or banks where you'll be on the road doing, you know, one location a week for the next six weeks uh, type of thing. So, yeah, cover the food, cover the per diem, pay them extra so the guys are motivated to go. Um, and typically... Customers might at first think, well, why am I hiring a painter from D.C. to come paint a building in, you know, Kentucky? Well, usually it's because it's, they've already bought into our system. We've already had the foreman do other locations for the same company in the same way. They can save money by not having to go to that area, vet a new painter, find a new painter, get all yep. these insurance, do all that, where we can just say, well, we'll send the same crew that just did this one here in Georgia, and they'll go ahead and do the one in Florida. Um, so it's a convenience to the customer. Also, we kind of found that once we started doing it, when the guys are on the road, all they tend to do is they eat, they paint, they sleep, you know, <laughs> so they want to get done quicker. So yep. the jobs are typically pretty productive <laughs> and the travel budget in a large job is usually 5% or less. And the bigger okay. the job is, it gets even less and less of a, of a factor. And if we can't figure out a way to make up 5% with better equipment, better guys, better production, better planning... Uh, we we can always make that up. And are are you are you paying these guys like you know a premium to 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 be away from yep. home and to travel? Yep, shift differential. You know we do yep. we do a lot of overnight work and night work, which they get. So we have, you know, we've got it all worked out. But they got painting rates. That of course they got overtime rate. They got carpentry. We have our own in house carpenters too. Um, and then, you know, they've got their out of town rate. So they're they're basically usually getting at least an extra three dollars an hour, um, okay. off the bat just to go. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, do you do you let people, uh, you know, kind of, if 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 they if they want to do this, they can opt in and volunteer, or do yeah. you find it where it's people who maybe don't have a family, or you know, it's easier for you know, kind of those 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 single single yeah. people to go and jump on these jobs, or how, how do you think about it in that regard? Well, what's funny is the younger guys probably do travel a little bit more. When yeah. we first started doing it a few years ago, uh, I remember standing up at a foreman meeting and being like, okay, hey, you know. We went and did this cool job. I don't remember where it was. And I was like, you know, we need some workers willing to travel. Let me see a show of hands. Barely any hands went up. And I'm like, uh-oh, how are we going to scale this if we can't get guys willing to travel? And then that's <laughs> when we sort of really started fine-tuning the extra money, the extra per diem, the extra pay. Also, the guaranteed hours. You know, they're 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 almost always going to get overtime on the road. Because like I sure. said, on an exterior, they can work sun up to sun down. We can work day and night. We don't care. And, and yeah. you make it up on the overtime. So, so how are you how are you tracking their hours and, and kind of managing all that overtime? Well, job dread. Um, you know, we had to have several meetings with them where we had to come in and, you know, cast a smartphone up on the wall so we could show them how to log in. We used to use a program called Exact Time. You know, there's a bunch of different timekeeping software. So they were already fairly familiar with logging in. Okay. So it wasn't that hard to switch them over to the new system where they can log in and we worked with Travis to get all the different rates set up and stuff and to get like, you know, all like we just talked about carpentry and OT and out of town. So they yep. log in on their phone. So we track the hours and that is one thing I really do love about job trends that we can always just open up any job, go in the tab, click on the time, say, okay, what's the budget? The budget's got 600 hours. We've already spent 240. Hey guys, this is where we're at on the hours. Make sure we're good. Um, yep. So that's kind of how we handle the hours part of it. Do you give do you give the guys any sort of additional incentive to to try to complete the jobs you know under budget you know on time? We do. Um, it's something new that we've been. We used to do it pre COVID. Uh, it got hard to track during COVID without the meetings, so we've started it back up. And it's something that my guy Adrian in the back here is is actually almost done with. We basically have built out a new spreadsheet, work with Travis a little bit, so we're dumping the the hours out into it so that each foreman has his own tab, each salesman have their own tab. And the guys do get a production, you know, quarterly production bonus, basically, if they meet their hours in the aggregate. So another awesome. little kicker to make sure that they're on budget. Yeah, that's great. What, uh, I mean, how far out are you scheduling these jobs? Like, it, it sounds like some of these, obviously, the travel ones has a lot more kind of planning and logistics yeah. that have to go into it. But like, what's your average, you know, kind of how many how many weeks, months out are you? Well, that's what's funny. It's just interesting. We're, we're sort of always 80% booked, you know, and then well, we can pull stuff up as needed. Um, yeah. 
we typically want to always leave room to squeeze in a few little things as we go for the last sure. minute stuff that comes up. So we try to space the schedule out so that we're like kind of always, you know, 75% booked. Um, yeah. But their, their commercial jobs can be planned months ahead of time, you know, when we know we have to go in several months. And even those big ones, though, can sometimes come up pretty crazy and we can get one because we can staff it. Yeah. You know, sometimes we'll be like, hey, I know this sounds crazy, but we have a job next week and we need eight guys. And it's like, okay, let's figure it out. That's another area where subs helps being able to scale faster. Yeah. Um, and job trade again, um, that was probably the hardest part for us to figure out in the beginning, honestly, was the scheduling. Because we had kind of built our own little Frankenstein spreadsheet that we were using for, we called it the eboard. And to be able to finally, we worked a lot um, with you guys trying to get the schedule right. Um, and now, now we love it, being able to have it on everybody's smartphone. Everybody can look at the schedule at any time and kind of see, you know, where all the guys are going for the next, you know, several weeks. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine a, a company, you know, your scale, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly something that's just a must-have at this point. Yeah. Yeah, we have a daily lineup that goes out. Um, we basically created a custom report inside of job tread that is like a, just a, a basically a one day snapshot. Uh, and then obviously we have the, the tasks view that we've built out several, you know, custom views so we can see where everybody is. Sure. So what's the, you know, kind of where, where, where's the company going? What's, what's the vision for the next, you know, few years, kind of what are your big initiatives that, you know, that, 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 that you want to get accomplished and, you know, kind of where, where do you see the, uh, the end goal being here? So the big stuff is kind of, we want to stay diversified. You know, we don't want to get rid of residential. We want to keep the residential. Um, we want to maintain that. That obviously grows at a slower pace. Um, and then we got the commercial going really good on top of it. And now kind of the third layer is the new stuff we've been adding with the traveling. So I kind of just want to get it to where we have, you know, equal divisions. Uh, everything's profitable. Everything's moving along. The traveling is exploding more than the the regular commercial to the point that we're actually kind of in the process right now of yeah. spinning it off into a its own business. So uh, it's going to be Will Go National Painting um, <laughs> as kind of a separate business that is going to handle that. Um, mostly so that we can have the, you know, proper employees assigned to the right stuff and subcontractors assigned to the right stuff. So sure. I would say that's probably the next step is even more of this, you know, moving around traveling type of painting for corporations and uh, banks and hospitals and the like. I mean, as you start to get, you know, kind of more and more traction within a particular market, I mean, do you think, will it, will you ever look at trying to sort of build a, a bench of, you know, of subcontractors in that market so they're not necessarily having to travel out? Or is it you always kind of want to have home base, you know, back in Virginia? I think the home base is going to be here. We, we did kind of think about that early on with our first couple of really big jobs, but then we realized, well, wait a minute, there's also another just as big job coming up in this market and this market. And yeah. it became too many different areas. We're pretty lucky in that we're like, we're right on the East Coast, halfway between the top and the bottom, you know, so we can get anywhere pretty quick. Um, so I think home base will always be here. Uh, okay. and then we'll just have jobs going in multiple States where that's another great thing about, you know, the, the times we're living in is without a smartphone and zoom and FaceTime, I think that would have been really hard to do like 10, 15 years ago and maintain the quality. But now that we can just, you know, my, my foreman, an example, we're doing a, a very large hospital job for the government right now. That's probably going to take, you know, it's a six plus month project all done at nights. Uh, so my, for my foreman to be able to just walk up and down the hall at the end of the night and talk into his smartphone and record a little <laughs> video of everything he did and then yeah. upload it. And then the customer can see it and then I can see it. And then we can hop on a Zoom once a week, me and her to have a planning meeting and just go from there. That's something that would have been really hard to do in the past. So there's new yeah. opportunities with new technology like you know, uh, who knows, maybe one day they'll be just like, I'll be a hologram walking around the hospital in a, <laughs> at a different state. Um, and then yep. job tread obviously helps keep, keep things organized. I guess, interesting backstory, I'll give you kind of where we came from. Um, my dad was very tech savvy, which was really great. So he actually built a custom Microsoft access database that we ran the original business off of. And it served us great for a long time, but it kind of got to the point where we had been looking for something like job tread for years and hadn't really found anything yet. And it was getting obsolete. I don't have the personal knowledge to work on it the way he did. It became his hobby. And he just kind of was always built. I would go to him and say, Hey, I want to report to track, you know, estimator hour by day of the week. And he'd go, okay. And that's what he would do that weekend. So 
to be able to find something, that was a big worry in our head was kind of when we're not going to use this anymore, how are we going to get all the information we're used to having? So when we met you guys, it was the first one. I don't know if you remember. It was at like, uh, I think it was like PCA like several years ago. Yeah, I think it was. And when you you guys were walking through, I'm like, oh, it's finally the first thing I saw where I get all the information. Um, <laughs> so we love going in that thing and building custom reports. And it's a learning curve like anything else. But I would just tell anybody looking at it, like, it's the first program I've seen where it's customizable to your business. Like that you yeah. can run a, a business with a li- few employees, a lot of employees, commercial, residential. Um, it really doesn't matter. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I know early on we, you know, before we had like the formulas, you know, it was, it was a little bit harder, I think, for for paint companies to kind of figure out, you know, how to estimate the jobs because some of them wanted to use production rates, yep. you know, they wanted to use kind of the material takeoff, um, you know, coming up with kind of those those formulaic quantities that, you know, I've seen a lot of paint companies have very elaborate kind of spreadsheets, you know, that yeah. they've, they've, they've typically built out to do that. And so, you know, I think since since adding those features, I mean, it's it's been a huge, um, you know, huge benefit to to companies that really have kind of very specific um you know kind of those those uh, labor you know production rate material takeoff you know because you know estimating out a job that you know is is, is you got to figure out how many hours or days yep. it's going to take you know you you know you're, you're you're selling that job with a fixed price you know but then you're you're operating it with a variable cost can be you know uh, it can be a little bit more risky than being able to kind of lock in you know your labor rate which you know i see again sometimes some people will Kind of use that that guaranteed amount for their subs, uh, yep. but obviously when you're paying your guys, you know, and their employees, you know, you're, you're you're paying them, and so however many hours they get, you know, logged to that job, I mean, that's that's going to determine you know your profitability of it. Yeah, painting is a little different, and, and like you said, the the benefit of the subs is that you can fix your labor costs. So obviously, yep. you you kind of know going in what you're going to get, but you know, you have to sell the job, and you have to you know put on your sales hat, communicate well enough to sell the job at a rate that you can produce it at and still make money. But yeah, I mean, we're more of an hours-based company and always have been. And I, th- I would say more painters probably are hours-based um, because you know, we have 18 different foremen that they don't yeah. all do it at the exact same rate. So it, it would be one yeah. thing to have a, okay, a stucco production rate, but I got 18 different crews. <laughs> um, so you can only get so complicated with it where yeah. at the end of the day, you just got to put a number on it and then make it happen. Yeah. Well, I think again, having a good, you know, you, you got a lot of historical data to really understand your numbers, understand kind of, you know, what 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 works for y'all, kind of how to how to estimate these, you know, it's it's not as easy when you're, you know, brand new company just trying sure. to, you know, figure it out from the, you know, from from a blank slate. So, you know, definitely takes takes some trial and error and kind of, you know, again, I, I think it's so important though that people take the time to review their performance on every job so that they can start to understand. I mean, are we are we underbidding things? Are we overbidding? Like, where are we? you know, what, what, what didn't work out? Let's, let's not keep making the same mistakes. You know, I think that's where job trade really helps these companies like to, to have that framework and that foundation to go and kind of analyze how did they, how did they do each time? Yeah. And I think the takeoffs is going to be cool when you guys get that rolled into there. Um, yeah. That will save everybody some time not having, and we don't do a ton of new construction, but the little bit that we do to be able to do a takeoff right from inside of that. Um, and I do think it's a software that naturally lends itself to painting companies. Like I, I, I do want to definitely get a few more painters in this so that we can share data and ideas. But, um, and we do have a couple other guys that are in there with me. I think, you know, there's a handful of painters using it already. Um, oh, yeah. a handful of bigger guys too. Um, have they, uh, I can't remember in the job tread pros Facebook group, did they, is there a separate, uh, kind of the, those side chats created for, uh, for painters yet? You know, I don't know. I would need to check. I do look at the Facebook group a lot. Um, uh, sure. and it's, it's cool to keep track of the updates and I see a lot of good stuff on that. Um, I haven't looked at the painter chat. I'll check into that, but, um, yeah, uh, it, it's definitely, um, definitely conducive to running a painting company. And well, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's obviously, you know, a rare opportunity to have somebody you know, who's, who's built a company, you know, to the size and, and scale that you have. So I really appreciate you sharing a lot of this insight. You know, I'm curious kind of in, in as, as we wrap up here, like, you know, is there any advice that you might give to to other businesses, you know, entrepreneurs, maybe people who are, who are considering, you know, getting off the tools, trying to, you know, focus on building out a business? Like, you know, what what do you think, you know, has been some of the best advice that, that you've gotten, you know, either from, you know, kind of mentors or some of these peer groups that you've joined, you know, what, 
what nuggets you want to leave our audience here? Yeah, with? well, I mean, I would think that would be the the main thing I would say was just what you said, peer groups and, and other audiences. Like, I don't know how anybody builds a business completely by themselves without getting other ideas, A, from your team and then from the people you, you meet with. If I, you know, I, I've been in multiple networks and peer groups over the years and, um, you don't always get great ideas. Sometimes you get ideas that you're like, Ooh, that wouldn't work for me. But sure. I would say almost everything we've done to grow is come from the seed of the idea has come from talking to somebody else that's already done it. So my yeah. advice would be, uh, the best thing that I ever did was probably when I came back to the company immediately and my dad, you know, was like, Hey, you got to be in these networking groups. You got to meet these guys. You got to be, spend time with these peers and visiting them and looking at, Oh, walking into someone's shop and seeing a super simple idea, you know, you're <laughs> like, Oh, I can do that. I can Hell. do that. So that would be my number one piece of advice would you join peer groups. And I've recently upgraded and joined to a new peer group um, with uh, guys in there that are larger companies than me. Um, that, you know, we can basically, it's, it's almost like, like I said, it's sanctioned cheating. You got to go around and find the guys that have already done it, see how they did it and then put yep. your own spin on it. And are these people that are typically in your local market or are they kind of, you know, national groups where, you know, you, you may not be, you know, competing, you're, you're more so kind of learning and, and, and helping yeah, each I mean, other. There's tons of different kind of groups. You know, there's all the mastermind groups and stuff that people are in on and they all cost money to be in. But if you, if you're the type of person that will go in listen to the advice and actually do something with it. They all pay for themselves many times over. So, you yeah. know, there's, there's local groups and there's national groups, all depending on what industry you're in, um, that you can join. And, and that's definitely the way to do it. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't, I can't reiterate how important it is, you know, for, for people to, again, find their tribe, find that network, that community, because, you know, again, you can save yourself so much time and energy and, and yep. just those, those hard lessons that, you know, you, you can, you can just learn from other people's experience, but yep. it does, it takes, you know, like, like you said, Rick, I mean, you, you've got to invest your own time yep. to go find, you know, those groups that, you know, that, that you're a good fit with that have similar businesses that, you know, you, you're, you're striving to, to grow up and be like, you know, but man, when you can, when you can tap into that, I mean, you're going to save, you know, just so oh. much time being able to learn and implement and, and start to emulate, you yep. know, those people who you want to be like, you know, it's, it's, you know, you, you can go at it alone if you want. I see a lot of entrepreneurs kind of do that and they think, oh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to network with other people in my area because, you know, I can't help the competition. But, you know, again, like this day and age, I mean, there is an abundance of work. Yeah. And so I think having that abundance mentality is going to take you a whole lot farther and a whole lot faster, you know, by working together with others and like helping everybody, you know, rising tide lifts all boats, like, you know, all contractors, you know, it, it's so important that, you know, from, from an industry standpoint that people, you know, do get organized and they do run their jobs more efficiently and effectively and, you know, deliver those, those great customer experiences that, you know, obviously we see a lot of the companies kind of in our community here are doing a great job at, but we need everybody, you know, in the industry as a whole to do that, you know, to, to really improve that reputation for contractors. Yep. And then just networking and meeting other business owners. And that's what's great about Job Tread True. Go to the Job Tread Connect if you haven't, because um, you can't always just listen to your own trade either. You know, uh, eventually, if you're in a group for so long, you will run into, you know, you'll run out of fresh ideas at some point. So to be able to talk to a, a debt guy or a landscaper guy and be like, oh, wow, I've never thought of that that way. Uh, so I always come back from whatever conference or networking event I go to and then bringing those events back to your team, bringing the ideas back, sitting down with them, telling you what you learned. And then also realizing though, that no matter what, not every idea is going to be good. And just because yeah. some work for someone else, you may try it and it may fail miserably. So being honest with yourself and no one went to pull the plug on that, say, well, well, that was a dumb idea. I messed that up. Let's start over. Um, yeah. I would say that's the biggest thing to, to kind of grow in. No, I, I love that, man. And, and, and I think too, like, again, just like you said, like, you know, it, sometimes you got to kind of look from different, you know, look in, in different areas, you know, to, yeah. to get some fresh perspectives and fresh ideas. I mean, you know, I tell people all the time, like, I mean, the, 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 the fundamentals of managing you know, these jobs based businesses is, is really not that different regardless. Nope. You know, if, if you're a painter, a deck builder, you know, a, a, a roofer, a home builder, remodeler, like, I mean, at the end of the day, like the fundamentals are very yep. similar, but there could be different kind of approaches, you know, and, and perspectives that I think being able to have that opportunity to learn, you know, even beyond kind of your, your focus, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the specific trades that, that you're doing is, is, is a great way to kind of, you know, find new ideas, new, new things that you can try out and, yeah, yeah. Not every, never, not every idea yep. is going to be a winner, you know, but, <laughs> yep. 
and you're going to mess up a lot. You know, yeah. building any business, you're going to mess up a lot. I I think if you're not messing up at some point, you're not trying enough new stuff or different stuff, or you're stuck in the same place. Yeah, because you're. It's just impossible to grow a business to any decent size. I think without looking back and going, well, that was a really dumb idea and it was my fault at just owning it and you know yeah. moving on to the next thing because you're still going to have problems there's going to be chaos when you run a business of any decent size there's going to be mondays in the spring where your your office didn't do it right and there's multiple people fighting over this truck and this piece of equipment yeah. and you sent the people to the wrong house we painted the wrong house uh, <laughs> i mean you're going to have those what's that You've painted the wrong house. We've painted the wrong house. Um, <laughs> we've accidentally, you know, paperwork mix up. Guys get there, customers not home. The house looks the same. <laughs> they painted the wrong house, or we've estimated the house and sold the job, and the guys show up and realize, well, we sent them an estimate and they accepted it, but we actually were looking at a different house when we put the <laughs> price on it. It is what it is. So oh, man. at the end of the day, you have to pay attention to the hours, but you also have to give the best quality no matter what. You have to do yeah. the job right. If it takes an extra day or two. Swallow the extra day. It's going to come back with karma and reputation and people are going to hire you because they know you do the right thing. Um, so yeah. you can't get so into the weeds that you count every hour and you lose sight of the big picture. So in contracting, that's probably the hardest part is knowing when to fight about it, when not to fight about it. Just move on and on to the next one. Yeah. Well, look, Rick, I appreciate you taking the time to to share all this inside, kind of share your story. You know, it's, it's, it's very much appreciated. You know, I appreciate everything you do for the community as well to try to help, you know, inspire, motivate others to, to be able to step their game up. Uh, so just, you know, th thank you again for, for, for being part of this community, for, for sharing your story on the podcast. And I'm excited to, uh, to, to see your continued growth and, you know, where you take this business over the next couple of years. Yeah, appreciate you, Eric, and I appreciate it. Glad we ran into and found and connected with you guys. Really happy with the software. Look forward to growing with you, seeing you at the events and going from there. Awesome. Thanks, Rick. All right, thanks. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Builder Stories. We hope you enjoyed the conversation and gained valuable insights that can help you in your journey along the way. Don't forget to subscribe to the show and leave us a review. And as always, if you or someone you know has a story to share, please contact us at builderstories.com. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Eric Fortenberry, and remember, every builder has a unique story. Keep building yours.